Iterative Learning Control, or ILC as I'll often call it, is a really interesting concept. As the name suggests, it's a controller that learns the optimal sequence of feedforward commands over the course of many iterations. And I think the two things that really set this controller apart from other data-driven methods is that one, it's learning a feedforward solution rather than a feedback solution, which makes ILC best suited for systems that repeat the same motion over and over again. And two, the way this method learns is really lightweight. In a lot of cases, it's just a simple matrix multiplication, which can make ILC well-suited for even low-powered embedded applications. Now, even if you don't plan on doing ILC in the future, I hope you stick around for this because I think it's a really elegant solution. And now there's a built-in block in Simulink that makes it really easy for you to just go and try out ILC on your own project. But before you go off and try implementing it right away, we should first spend some time understanding how ILC works. So let's go do that. I'm Brian, and welcome to a MATLAB Tech Talk. Imagine you're trying to get a system to repeat the same motion through the same environment over and over again. For example, think about a pick and place robotic arm. The arm starts at some known point, and then it moves to pick up a piece, and then it places it somewhere else, and then moves back to the starting point, where it waits until the next iteration. After that, the whole sequence is repeated again. Now, since the path and the environment is the same every single iteration, we could learn the sequence of inputs to the actuators that moves this system perfectly along this desired path. And then we just execute those commands open loop, or feed forward. Now, I think a good analogy for this is like playing a video game. You want to get your character to the end goal. And one way to do this is to just try a sequence of commands over one iteration, and then assess afterwards how they did. So, you know, if you failed to jump at the right time, then adjust your commands accordingly between iterations and try again. And if the environment is always the same, you know, for example, the bad guys always appear in the same place at the same time every time that you start over, then with trial and error, you could learn the exact sequence of commands needed to beat the game. And at this point, you could just program those commands and execute them autonomously anytime you want to beat the game. So in this way, you wouldn't even have to observe your character or measure anything at all to make corrections with feedback. You would just know that the learned sequence of commands always successfully get your character through the environment and to the goal every time. And this is the idea of iterative learning control. Now, hopefully it's obvious that these specific commands would only work if you start in the same place every iteration and you end in the same place, and that the environment and its disturbances are the same every single iteration. Now, this is true for some video games, but it's also true for many real-world systems. For example, manufacturing robots often work in environments like this, like the pick-and-place arm, or one that has to weld the same parts in the same place each time. Or ILC could be used for pointing an antenna that has to trace the same path through the sky. Or for medical robots that have to do predefined surgical procedures. Or for accelerating and decelerating subway trains to ensure smooth operation. You know, pretty much any repetitive task with low variation between iterations are good candidates for ILC. So, now that we know, you know, when to use it, let's get into how ILC works. Let's say that the system we want to control has the following dynamics in state space form, and the initial state of the system is zero. So the input u at time t comes into the system, and then this generates an output y at time t. And now we can take the input and output across the entire iteration and package them into two matrices, capital YK and capital UK. And these capture the whole sequence for the inputs and outputs of one iteration. And then from here, we can write the input-output relationship as yk equals some matrix g times uk, and g is the input-output matrix defined by the system dynamics. Now, it's worth noting that the system could be single input, single output, or multi-input, multi-output, and g is going to be sized accordingly based on the a, b, and c matrices. For example, for a single input, single output system with n control actions per iteration, G becomes an n by n matrix. So in block diagram form, the system looks like this. 
And then from here, we can just keep building out this block diagram for the rest of ILC. Since U changes from one iteration to another, we'll say that this particular one is the kth iteration of U, and it produces the kth iteration of Y. All right, so use just a sequence of hard-coded open loop commands, and we want to know how well this particular set of inputs does at making the system follow some reference. Therefore, we compare the output to this reference signal, and then the difference between them is the error across the entire iteration. All right, so now the question that we have is how do we update U in the next iteration such that the error across the entire run is reduced? Well, this is how ILC does it. We filter the error through some learning function L. And I'm gonna to get to what L looks like in just a second, but for now, we'll just keep it as this generic function. Now this produces a delta U signal, and we add that to UK to get the new input UK plus one. Now, in many practical applications of ILC, often a low-pass filter is added here to remove high-frequency noise and to reduce chattering in the controller. However, to keep this as simple as possible, so we can you know, really just focus on how ILC learns, I'm not gonna include it in our block diagram. All right, so now that we have an updated U, we input that into the system, which produces YK plus one, and then we compare that to the same reference as before, and we get a new error for this second iteration and start the cycle over again. But here is the interesting question. Can we guarantee that the error at k plus one is always less than the error at k. If so, then we know that u is being adjusted in a way that makes the system better at following the reference, you know, since the error is being reduced. Well, to answer that question, we need to find a function that compares e at k plus one to e at k. e k plus one is equal to r minus y k plus one. And then if we go back one step, y k plus one is just g times u k plus one. And then if we go back one more step, u k plus one is u k plus l times e k. And here we can expand this function into these three terms. So now we can reduce this by realizing that g u k is just y k, and then r minus y k is e k. So now after we pull out e k from the right hand side, what we're left with is that the error in the next iteration is equal to the identity matrix minus GL times the current error. This is called the error dynamics equation, which dictates how the error changes each iteration. And the important part of this equation is this I minus GL part, because for the error to be reduced, then the magnitude of I minus GL must be less than one. And that makes sense, right? will always be multiplying the error by a number less than one, and so the error is going to shrink over time. And making sure that this is true is where the clever selection of the learning function comes into play. The first two learning functions that I'm gonna cover are both model-based approaches. And this means that we need to know the state space equations that represent our system. And therefore, we need to know the input-output matrix G. In that case, one option for L could be inverting the dynamics of the system. In this case, L equals G inverse. And with this, the error dynamics equation would look like this, where the error in the next iteration is equal to I minus G G inverse times the current error. And G G inverse is just the identity matrix, and then subtracting the two is zero. So if we have a perfect model, then error would go to zero after one iteration. But, you know, making the learning function exactly the inverse of G is risky because we almost never have a perfect model. So inverting it wouldn't completely cancel the system and it could lead to instability. Therefore, instead of trying to reduce the error in a single iteration, we could add a scalar term, gamma, and we can use that to remove part of the error each iteration. Now, gamma must be between zero and two to make sure that the gain of this equation stays below one and therefore learning will converge. All right, so inverting the dynamics is the first model-based method, but there's another popular model-based approach that's based on gradient descent. And here's how it works. We can create a cost function j, that's a function of the error squared, and then the error is just a function of the input u. 
So if we want to lower error, then between iterations, we need to change the input u in the direction that lowers j. And the way we do this is by taking a partial derivative of j with respect to u to get the gradient. And then we adjust k in the negative direction, or in the direction that descends the gradient. Now, to take this partial derivative, there are a few steps, and I'm going to quickly go through them right here. So you may want to pause the video to go line by line yourself if I go too fast. But to start, we substitute r minus g u for e in the cost function to get the relationship between u and j, and then we expand the equation. Now we take the partial with respect to u of each of these terms and some like terms to get this result. And then here, the 1 half and the 2's cancel out, and then we can pull g transpose out from both terms. And then you'll notice that we have this r minus g u term at the end here, which is just the error in the current iteration. So finally, we want the negative slope, which turns out to be g transpose times e k. Now if we go back, we can replace this negative gradient here that we're adjusting our input by. We can replace it with g transpose times e. And this means that our learning function L is just G transpose. And if we plug that into the error dynamics equation, we get that the magnitude of I minus G G transpose needs to be less than one. However, once again, we can adjust the learning rate by adding in a scalar term gamma. And so gamma must be between zero and two over the magnitude of G squared to once again guarantee that learning will converge. And it's kind of interesting to me that these two methods look very similar, you know, with G transpose and G inverse, but we came at it from two different ways. Now, a downside of both of these methods is that they require a model of the system. We need to have that understanding of G, even if it's not a perfect representation. But the upside is that since we're dealing with matrices, they work for both single input, single output systems, as well as multi input, multi output systems. So they're very powerful approaches. However, if you don't have a reliable model of the system, then we need to turn to a model-free approach. And the downside of model-free, however, is that it's really best suited for just single input, single output systems. I think a good way to understand how model-free single input, single output ILC works is to switch our thinking from matrices to transfer functions. And if we go back to this block diagram, everything here could be represented in the S domain. So in this case, the block diagram simplification that we did earlier would be the exact same, except for the error dynamics equation, which would have a one minus GL instead of the identity matrix. And this is because we're just dealing with single input, single output systems. And now the inequality that we need to satisfy would be the magnitude of one minus GL has to be less than one. So in this case, the question is now, how can we choose L if we don't have a perfect system model G? Well, one way we can think about this is by looking at the frequency characteristics with a Nyquist plot. The Nyquist curve of one minus GL must be within a circle of radius one centered at the origin. This way the gain is never larger than one. So one minus GL has to be contained within this circle and therefore the Nyquist curve of GL itself must be within this circle, which is moved to the right by one. So that's our requirement. If the Nyquist curve of GL falls outside of this circle, even for just a few frequencies, then the error will grow for those frequencies and the learning will not be stable. And unfortunately, this is a very restrictive constraint. For one, the gain of GL can never be larger than two, and that's just at a phase of zero degrees. It's much less at other phase shifts and the phase can never be shifted by more than 90 degrees. Now, many real world systems break this requirement since often they behave like higher order systems that have more than minus 90 degrees of phase shift, and that's a problem. But this is where clever choices for the learning function L come into play. Even if we don't know the exact dynamics of G, knowing the approximate dynamics can still help us determine what L should be. For example, let's assume that G is some first order process that produces this Nyquist curve. In this case, the Nyquist curve of G by itself stays within the learning circle. So L could just be one. 
However, let's say that you do have some uncertainty in the gain, and it might be larger. Or the system itself might produce a Nyquist curve that exceeds the circle at some frequencies. In this case, we need L to reduce the gain to bring it back in. And instead of L being a 1, we can make it a scalar, gamma p, and make it less than 1. This is going to slow down the learning process, so it would require more iterations to converge, but it will be more robust to gain uncertainty. And this is a proportional error feedback approach. Now, let's assume that your system is some second order process, one whose phase does shift more than minus 90 degrees. In this case, a proportional only error feedback is not going to work. We need to add in some phase to rotate the curve back into the circle. And so the next logical step is to add a derivative to L, to add back in 90 degrees of phase at higher frequencies. Now we can scale this term by gamma d, and between that and the proportional term, we can find some combination that keeps the Nyquist curve of GL safely within the learning circle. Now, this learning function is pretty common, but we could make it more complex by adding in higher order derivative terms, or, you know, really anything we need to keep the learning process stable for whichever system we need to control. But the bottom line is, we don't need an exact model of G to ensure that ILC converges. We just need to know enough about the system to guarantee that the Nyquist curve of GL is going to stay within the learning circle. And you might be thinking, well, that seems pretty hard to guarantee. But there is something we have control over that we haven't discussed yet. And do you know what that is? That's right, it's the system itself. We can change G in a way that helps ILC converge. Remember, this is our open loop ILC block diagram. But instead of operating the system completely open loop, we could design a feedback controller in parallel to the ILC controller. So now, instead of the open loop system G, the error dynamics are a function of the closed loop system. And not only is this going to stabilize your system and get it to do something close to what you want while the ILC controller is in the learning phase, but we can make the closed loop system behave like a first or second order process. And if we do that, then we can get away with a model free proportional derivative learning function. And this is why you will often implement ILC alongside a feedback controller. So you have the ultimate flexibility in ensuring that the learning process converges. So you might be wondering why we would even use ILC if we have to develop a feedback controller anyway, right? Well, the reason is because you can get much better performance from your system if you fine tune with ILC. Remember, these are systems that are doing the same motion over and over again in the same environment. And a feedback controller can accomplish that, but potentially with increased errors that come from disturbances or from uncertainty in the plant itself. And so why accept those errors when you can remove them using an ILC controller in conjunction with a feedback controller? In this way, you can really get the most out of these systems that do repeated motions. All right, so this video just covered the basics of what ILC is and how it works. But if you want to see how you can apply ILC to something practical, like getting a drone to follow a flight path, and you want to see how simple it is to set up an ILC controller in MATLAB and Simulink, then check out this follow-up video where we go through that exact implementation. It's pretty cool to see it in action. And I've put a link to this video in the description below. All right, so that's where I'm going to leave this video for now. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any future videos. Also, you can find all of the Tech Talk videos across many different topics nicely organized at mathworks.com. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.